and uh, main using the most. But we're going. Yeah, it's on. Can everyone hear me? Is that too loud? All right. Good morning. My name is Matt Bianco. I'm the senior systems engineers at Netsco. And uh, I'm going to talk about addressing your cloud security risks. Just some things that, that you need to be aware of. Um, you know, as you're going down the road of, of thinking about cloud and what that means to your organization, uh, there's going to be things in here that, that may seem familiar, but there's certainly going to be things in here that you probably never thought of. So just a quick poll here. How many people have actually started down the path of cloud security? Oh, cool. All right. So if I asked that question a year and a half ago, there was no hands. Right. So we're definitely making progress in that. Uh, now, one thing I'll tell you, if um, if you're going to ask a question, you can ask questions. We can make this interactive. I'm happy to do that. Uh, I like it that way. One question I will not answer is anything about architecture, because that'll that's a Texas-sized rat hole, and <laughs> we will get derailed for 50 minutes on that, okay? But I do have a slide at the end if we have time. Um, if not, you can come and talk to me. I know Ken Dickey from Cadre is speaking at 2 o'clock. He's going to cover architecture uh, himself. So as I mentioned, come and talk to me after if you want to know more about how you implement this, how does it fit in the environment, etc. Stand by. Okay. When we talk about cloud security, what, what's interesting is, is you may think immediately, well, that means that you want to, you just want to block things and you want to stop it from happening, right? And that's not the case at all. Cloud security, is just, or cloud is a good thing, right? I, I use cloud every day. I mean, who doesn't use cloud in here? If anybody raises their hands, they'll freak me out, <laughs> right? But we all use it. Um, even sharing grocery lists with my wife on, on iCloud, you know, that's that's cloud. Gmail, Dropbox, I mean, the things that we do even on a personal level, that's all cloud. So cloud is fantastic. And there's a lot of business needs for cloud if you think about it, right? I mean, we can spin up an app. Uh, we don't have to pull in servers. We don't have to pay for power. Uh, quick to market, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why cloud is where it is and why larger organizations are adopting cloud. It makes perfect sense. Uh, but we do obviously have to wrap some security around it in order for it to be, you know, where we want it to be, like our internal networks that get hacked all the time. So if we talk about the way kind of things used to be, and this is a very basic slide, but there's a purpose to this, right? We had our, I'll point to it, you know, our, our internal network here. Right, with our servers and everything used to be consolidated in one place and it seemed easy. Obviously those things were still getting hacked all the time, right? Because users are our biggest vulnerability. And if we wanted to, our, you know, our data was all internal. If we wanted to connect to that data, um, we would just connect to it because we were already on the network. And if we were outside the network, it was very simple, right? We'd hand back in and, and uh, we'll call those the good old days. However, if you look at what's in here, gateways, firewalls, IPS, you know, DDoS, that sort of thing. All of the tools that we're using today were built for that scenario, right? Now what we're trying to do is take those tools and somehow extend those out into the cloud. And that doesn't work because they weren't built for that. What they were built for is this, right? So we we just can't use those tools to that extent. Well, we see some tools out there that are trying to adapt proxies and things that are trying to bolt on, you know, CASB offerings to what they already have. And it just, 
the architectures are all wrong. Don't ask me a question about architecture. <laughs> um, so um, the problem with the problem with cloud is also the solution, or the solution is the problem. Either way, there's 22,000 identified cloud apps. So first thing we need to do is identify what the heck is a cloud app. And that is not a URL-based website that you just go to consume, um, you know, like CNN.com or ESPN.com. Those aren't typically security risks other than maybe drive-by malware. Uh, you know, I'm not worried about people getting into ESPN.com unless you want to see my fantasy team, which is 0-2, by the way, so <laughs> you don't want to see that. Um, but that's, that's also the solution, right? There's all these great apps out there, 22,000-plus of them, that are available for every line of business. So you think about it, finance, um, HR, everything that we can think of, even coding happens in the cloud. In fact, I've been at a couple startups now, Medscope is my third one, and every company that's coming out of California that is a startup doesn't ever buy a single server. So there is no servers in our company whatsoever, not even one, because everything that we do is in the cloud, from our mail to our, our development, right? Everything, because we can collaborate on that very easily. Now, hopefully, we're in a good position because we offer cloud security, so eat our own dog food, right? But that is uh, a staggering number, and we'll talk a little bit more about why that matters. Now we have this, this uh, even in this hybrid approach, but definitely everything, you know, our data that once was in, in the cloud or on-premise is now moving to the cloud, and, and to some extent I can make the argument we want it there. There's, there's probably uh, significant security controls around some of the apps that, that are out there. Uh, believe it or not, Microsoft is one of them. You know, they put a lot of work into their security, which sounds like it's not true, but it actually is, even if it is Microsoft, right? So when people want to access the data now, we're accessing it from every, we can get it to it from no matter where we are. Uh, but that introduces additional problems into this because now if you look where our perimeter was now our perimeter is the end user right uh, so you have to think in terms when cloud security is your perimeter is the end user it is not in the four walls it's not your data center anymore even if you haven't adopted a cloud app it's still the end user because they still have the ability to take data and move it to their own personal versions of things <coughs> So this is uh, based on our own data points, and this is absolutely true. In fact, these, uh, the numbers below are a little bit generous. I'll talk about that. When we do risk assessments, which is a very easy thing to do, we can grab proxy logs and, and firewall logs and things and, and, and tell people at a glance what the overall issues are. What we find on average is there's a 1,000 apps. This, this number has actually changed a little bit. There's a thousand apps that are being used in every organization, and that I've never seen the number below 700, and I've seen that number between five and six thousand for larger organizations. So imagine that five thousand applications that are being utilized. Um, the question becomes, how many of those are sanctioned by the company? So, quick definition of sanctioned versus uns unsanctioned. Pretty simple. Sanctioned is it means it's been IT vetted. Uh, they have some administrative control over the application, right? They control the users that can get into it. Now, remember, at no time do they control the app. They can't go and say, hey, Microsoft, for OneDrive, use different encryption. They can't do that, right? Or add this feature. They can ask, but, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily happen. So that means that, and by the way, that 10% for sanctioned applications is very generous because if the number is a thousand that means a hundred apps have been sanctioned by IT. I, I haven't come across a single company yet where a hundred applications were actually sanctioned. When people think about this they're thinking in terms of three apps, five apps, right? That means that that number is probably closer to one percent meaning what's below is everything that's unsanctioned and that's somewhere between 90 and 99 percent. So when you're talking about a cloud security strategy, it has to encompass this entire thing. It can't be that top line. And, and we'll talk about generation one 
CASBs versus Generation 2 CASBs and, and what the differences are. But one of them is that top line. That was a Generation 1 CASB, which is let's just uh, control the sanctioned apps, right? But as you can see, if the majority of the app usage and the majority of the data that's going out is going into unsanctioned apps, then we need to control the whole thing. The other part of this is, is SSL inspection, right? A CASB should be doing SSL inspection automatically because 100% of the traffic that is going to these cloud apps is, is SSL or TLS encrypted. So without it, you don't have any visibility. You're basically back to the days of a proxy, which is a blocker allow strategy. All right, so quick poll here. How, how much data or business data do you think exists in the cloud? today. Anybody have an answer here? It's actually probably less than you realize. Uh, because we're really at the footnotes. It's a percentage and we have a percentage to throw on. 20, uh, yeah, it's 30% right now. Um, so close. And rapidly growing. Because what I've seen, even over the last year, is very large organizations that are really starting to adopt cloud. And that's Really large organizations have a lot of data, right? Uh, small organizations have adopted cloud for, for a few years because it's, it's been easy for them to implement. But now we're seeing the adoption of these large organizations because they don't want to pay data center costs, right? They don't buy servers anymore. In fact, Microsoft doesn't want to sell you server licenses anymore. Has anybody tried to do that recently? Try to buy server 2012 and Microsoft says, hey, why don't you use Office 365? They don't want to sell it to you because they want everybody moving into that platform. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. Uh, so if we have 30%, right, that means that's, that's an ever-increasing amount of data that's going to the cloud. But we're still susceptible to the same things that we always have been. Uh, we, we still have to worry about data breaches. Now, I go back to that other statement where you don't control the application. So the best that you can do in this scenario is to make sure you have a resource where you can vet out applications before you ever use them. Find out which applications are actually being used and make sure that the one that you choose or the handful that you choose fall in line with your compliance. So when you get into audits, you're not failing those because you can't make them change the app, right? You don't want to fail those and pay penalties. The rest of this uh, I'm not going to talk about because you guys are all, we're all security people here. This is why we're here, uh, because of the last two points, right? We want to stop data from getting out. And really, at, at the crux of this, that is the point. We don't control the app, right? What we do control is the data. So obviously, in any cloud security strategy, the data has to be the most important thing. And that's where our focus should be. How do we protect the data from the user to wherever it's going? And that's what we're going to be uh, we're going to be discussing. Any questions thus far? You're awesome, right? Oh, uh, so this didn't come up before. <laughs> All right, there you go. This is what I was talking about: <laughs> data breaches, uh, failed audits, and the rest that you guys. Know. Okay. So the question becomes: you know, How are you addressing that risk today? And I can answer that question. Uh, I've talked talk to a lot of companies, right? And I get pretty good picture of their infrastructure. And going back to that, that second slide that I showed, they're addressing it the same way they address their internal needs. And that's it, right? Which is, we have proxies, we have firewalls, we have, you know, DLP, that sort of thing. Again, none of that extends to the cloud easily. Uh, and it certainly doesn't see the cloud in the way that the cloud needs to be seen in order for you to audit it and, and take action on it. So when you go down this path, you should be asking me that question. You know, how do our current controls work for cloud usage? Um, and the short answer, as it again, is it doesn't. Uh, so you need a new strategy for that. And that's where CASBs uh, came into existence. Now, if we go back to that original picture, uh, this was the strategy back in 2005, which was, hey, we'll just block everything. Right. We're going to use our proxies. These things are brand new. Let's just block everything. This thing's falling down. Um, 
So yeah, so that's not really sustainable, right, in, in any kind of cloud strategy. Because we want the cloud to be used. So how can blocking be a strategy? You know, it just doesn't work. And uh, it's never going to work because that's not the world we live in anymore. It worked in 2005 because we didn't have the mobile app usage that we have now. I mean, everybody was connecting through browsers, and there weren't a lot of cloud apps back then, by the way, so that wasn't that hard. So we were just doing URL filtering. So 2005 was easy, but a few years ago, first generation CASBs came out and said, all right, here's your strategy. Let's sanction one app, and then we'll block everything else. So similar strategy, but now you just have one app that you're allowed to use. Again, it's not a, blocking is never going to be a sustainable strategy. So if you come to me after this and say, hey, Matt, tell me how I can block better. I'm not going to answer that because that's not a strategy, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, and one of the reasons why that is not a strategy is because we, what we find is that they end up opening up and punching holes through those to begin with. Right? So they try to block everything, and then HR comes and says, wait, I need all these apps. And then finance comes and says, I need all these apps. Right? So now all of a sudden you have what we call exception sprawl happening. And what we've actually found is that 90% uh, of the cloud app usage is actually from blocked apps because they've opened them up. And those are based on you know, all the assessments that, that we've done. So right there is one reason why blocking doesn't work. The other reason is blocking is a non-prem, typically, solution. So as soon as you leave or you pick up your mobile phone and go on the LTE network, uh, you can go wherever you want, right? So a lot of holes in blocking strategies. So that doesn't save you from anything. So the question becomes, um, what do we do? And oh yeah, by the way, you know, you can just find another app that's probably far less secure to use and that is not in your proxy category list and just use that because that's what people do. Eventually, if you're blocking Dropbox and places where they want to move data to, they're just going to find an app that you're not blocking. And that's typically the security on those is, is terrible. But you don't go to their website. Um, the one that I pick on all the time is Zippy Share. Right? We see that being used in places. And you're not going to go to Zippy Share and on their website, and they're going to tell you, hey, by the way, this app is a piece of junk. <laughs> right? Nobody says that. They're going to say, hey, you get one gig of free storage. How great is that? But when if you have the ability to vet out that app, it, it has no security. The only piece of security that it has is SSL, which is easy to do because you just buy a couple certificates, right? But there's no encryption at rest, there's no compliance, there's nothing. And this is a place that people are potentially moving data. Without that SSL inspection, what kind of data is it? Right? We'll get to that. So the way you should think about cloud security is it being an enablement technology, not a disablement technology, right? Again, the blocking doesn't work, so you have to enable what people are going to use anyway. They're going to figure it out, so just let them use it. But let them use it safely, and, and that should really be how you're approaching cloud security. Um, in security, we're kind of hardwired a little bit um, to figure out ways to stop people from doing things or stop people from getting infected with things or you know, it's all about stopping. So when we talk about security, it's a little weird to talk about enabling. But you'll find that this strategy yields much more security than your blocking strategy. Because this strategy will allow your users to do what they need to do, and you can protect them wherever they are. It doesn't matter if they're on-prem, off-prem, managed device, unmanaged device. We can protect them. <clears throat> so the other part part of this, uh, and I haven't got to the six steps yet, but I will. Um, we have 50 minutes, so we, uh, we can talk to them. The other part that I find that's a little bit difficult is, uh, since this is kind of a newer space, we're, as I mentioned before, really at the foothills of this exploding, right? Um, as people adopt more and more, the security becomes more and more important. It's still a little difficult to talk to leadership about about this whole process and why it's important. Right? So we actually um, need to provide them something that they can reference that shows them 
what the issue is. And any CASB, typically, um, there's a few that don't, but most of them do, will come in, they'll grab some proxy logs from you or firewall or SIN. They will do some magic on the back end and parse those logs. And they'll tell you what the problem is, and they'll basically create a story for you. And you can take that story and you can hand it to your leadership and say, you know what, by the way, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we're using 1,500 apps. We thought it was 20. And we don't have any way of knowing what kind of data that is going through there because the vast majority of companies aren't doing SSL inspection, right? This is definitely something I know. Uh, there's a very, very small percentage of companies that are doing SSL inspection on that traffic. And even when they are, they're not seeing it in the context of cloud because cloud speaks API, right? So SSL inspection is great if you're just looking at all the data, but if you don't understand the context of what a user is trying to do, you're missing the boat on, on a lot of it. But most companies aren't doing SSL inspection. So now there, I, I talked to a customer not too long ago. We were sitting across the table and, and Believe it or not, they're trying to convince their leadership to allow them to SSL inspect that traffic. And she said, today, statistically, we are blind to 40% of our traffic going through. Now, yeah, we can see the headers, right? We can see where it's going. But that's it. It doesn't tell us what the payload is. We can't inspect the document. We don't know if that's sensitive data going out to the cloud. We have no way of knowing it. So we're blind to 40% of that. Next year, it's going to be 60%. A few years from now, it's going to be 80% because SSL is easy to do. Right? So in any strategy, the question you need to ask is, how are you SSL inspecting my traffic? And, and today, CASBs, will have, they have to do that automatically. So if you have an SSL project that's been sitting on the shelf waiting for you to figure out how that's going to hit performance, what kind of appliances you're going to need to buy, you know, all of that stuff, which is a huge cost, um, look at this to replace that project because it has to be done anyway. And by the way, the SSL inspection is happening in the cloud. It's not happening on your premise. There's no performance in it, right? The cloud's much more robust. So that's something to think about when you're approaching this, is this will take two projects that you really have and consolidate them down to one. So this is uh, something I just threw and I thought was pretty interesting. It's going, talking to leadership about it. This is the National Association of Corporate Directors. It's just a website that's dedicated to, you know, leadership and collaboration and, and things. And, and there's some questions on here, and I love this. It says, questions directors can ask to assess the board's cyber literacy. <laughs> so I would love to get this questionnaire back and just see exactly what would come back from there. But you know, basically the question that they're talking about is, how do we know that our crown jewels are protected? Our intellectual property. You know, if we work for a car manufacturer, our drawings of our future cars or concept cars, and you know, how do we make sure that that stuff is, is protected? If we're blind to 40% of our traffic today, how are we sure that it hasn't gone out already, right, and got into some cloud apps? So this strategy with what I just talked about, right, that, that risk assessment that you can get done by anybody. And to some extent, you can probably do it yourself if you, you know, knew what you were looking for. Um, because what, what a cloud security broker will do is look at those 22,000 apps specifically. Because those apps are places where you can put data, you can move corporate data, and that includes things like Facebook, where you can post, you know, credit card numbers. You can post that on Twitter. You can post that on Facebook. So you have to look at all of those places where data could potentially go, right? So ask them this question, plop down that risk assessment in front of them, and, you know, I always like to say, once you see it, you can't unsee it. You can't bury your head back in the sand and say, nope, I didn't see that. You know, there's 1,500 apps or more that are being used. We have no visibility into the data, so we have no idea what our exposure really is. The only way that we're going to know that is to get a CASB, get in line with that traffic fully, SSL inspect it automatically, uh, and then look at it from a policy. That's the only way that we're going to know that our sensitive data isn't getting out of this organization. Or that somebody is going home, putting something on Dropbox, going home working on it, and lo and behold, they just shared it out unintentionally publicly to the world. You know, what stops that from happening? Not, none of the tools, so I just blew holes in all the tools that you guys had, sorry. <laughs> go to their friend's house. 
you need to download a document to edit it and upload it back. Yeah. All of that, those scenarios have to be protected, right? So you can start seeing where those tools that you have internally start falling off, right? And you need to be able to protect that exact scenario. And the only way to do it is, is with the CASB, with the next generation of CASB, I should say. Okay, so one of the things that we have to talk about, though, uh, which is very important, is all the ways people use and access cloud apps. So if I asked you today and said, hey, what, you know, how do you access cloud apps or how do you think people do it? You're going to say, well, you know, browser. And comparatively, the browser is actually the easiest thing to control. Because browsers we can redirect, right? Um, we can get in front of browsers. Browsers are, are, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier than the other ways. But that only accounts, believe it or not, for 50% of the, the access to cloud apps. So the other one is sync clients. And, and by the way, as my laptop's running this presentation, it's syncing files to box behind the scenes. That is not going to go through a reverse proxy. Um, and that's what a lot of CASBs will sell, is a reverse proxy. Okay. A sync client is hard-coded hard -coded to go directly to the application. So you can't get it to redirect anywhere. The only way to solve that use case is to get in front of it with a forward proxy and intercept the traffic as it's going. You can't redirect it anywhere. So mobile apps, right? How many people in here pick up their phone and say, you know what, I'm going to go to... Office 365, and I'm just going to use the browser. <laughs> One. <laughs> Nobody does that, right? I mean, you download the app. You you download, if you're going to Box, you download the Box app. If you, Salesforce, you download the Salesforce app. But we don't use the browser except to do quick Google searching. Everything else we download an app for. And so these are the same as sync clients. You cannot redirect an app. The only way to get in, to do this is to get in front of the app in a forward proxy mode so you can intercept the traffic rather than try to steer it somewhere. Right? And then something people don't think about a lot are in the app ecosystems. So if I have Salesforce, there's probably a hundred, probably more than a hundred, apps that connect into Salesforce and can manipulate data, pull data down. How do you protect that? So these when you think about your cloud security strategy, it's all of these things. You can't just protect the browser and say, you know, we're good. Um, because that gets you a fraction of the issue coverage. You have to cover all of these, every one, to get 360 degree coverage for your cloud apps. And if we if we do that, right, and we get in line with that traffic and we can see it, we're SSL inspecting it then it allows us to um, ask some questions. And if you ask them today, you know, are risky activities taking place? Is sensitive data leaking? The answers to that is you probably have no idea, um, unfortunately. But that's the truth. That's the world we live in, right? Uh, but you can. And how about, you know, if it's coming from a managed or unmanaged device, kind of supporting that use case that you talked about. Um, is it on the network? Is it off the network? Is it you know, if it's managed, do they get the same access that unmanaged devices get? That all, we can do that with NAC on our internal networks, right? But we can't do it in the cloud. I mean, you can, um, but you're probably not. So that has the ability to see all of that stuff and then adjust uh, how, it, what, and how and what you can access based on, on that fact, right? And then threat protection, we'll talk about, about that, but, you know, it all folds into the same security strategy. So, all right, one thing, I'll build this out. One thing I want to cover here is, you know, being able to see the data the right way, too. So if you look at proxy logs and firewall logs, you're going to see HTTP transactions back and forth like crazy. And then report on them and say, you know what, somebody went to Google Drive, that's 100 sessions, uh, HTTP raw sessions reported. If you go to Box, they have, it's 20 for the same activity, which was a user logs in, browses an empty folder, uploads a file, and shares a file. There's 100 activities reported, right? So proxies and firewall, they don't sessionize the data. So it looks very messy, and it's very inaccurate. Um, it may mislead us into thinking that there's more Google Drive usage than there is Box, because we're just looking at session data, right? So one thing CASB will do is sessionize that data. You can see it's one session out of all of that that a user went in, he uploaded a file, viewed a file, et cetera. That's one session. 
Same thing with box, right? So now the data actually starts making a lot more sense than when you're just looking at proxy data and trying to make decisions on it. Another view of that is uh, if you just view an empty folder on Google Drive, it's still 100 sessions. <laughs> you know, it's just, that's how Google works. Um, and that is seven on box. So neither one are right, it's just how they report it and how, and how many transactions it takes, uh, you know, connections and things. So that doesn't really do us any good. So here's one of the things I want you to walk away with today. This is critical. When you're talking about your cloud security strategy, in order to do this correctly, in order to be an enablement technology, yet be more secure, you have to see the activities that happen inside of every app. Not just your sanctioned apps, every single app. You need to be able to see what is that user doing inside of Zippy Share, right? Because if you see that, and we can call that uh, Deep API inspection, because that's how we talk to cloud apps. So being able to see those API calls and exactly what they're doing and normalize those, we can see what an upload is, a share, an edit, a post, a create. And then when you go to your policy engine, you can say, you know what? These apps, I'm not going to allow upload to, especially not our corporate data. So now we haven't blocked the app, but we've now protected the user from doing something stupid, like moving our data where it doesn't belong, right? And now we're out of that blocking strategy. Now we're just blocking the risky behavior rather than trying to block the apps. We'll talk about something that kind of couples with that. But those are critical to your cloud security strategy. So when you're vetting this out, when you're talking to companies, make sure you ask them this question. How deeply do you see the activities inside of the app? Because that couples with DLP, with policy, and you can create policy around that, which has nothing to do, again, with blocking it out. So I finally got here. <laughs> so <laughs> six steps. Um, some of these we've covered before, right? Step one is to discover the, uh, the problem. And this is, remember, talking to your leadership. This is the part where you're going to present them with, you know, a story, which is just a report that says this is how many apps you're using. And, you know, this is how much data is going back and forth to those apps, and these are all the risky apps. So, therefore, these are our risky users. So, it's, it's very straightforward, uh, but it's in the context of cloud usage. Now, this is derived from proxy logs, which we know, based on what I've already talked about, that that is very high-level, 30,000-foot view of the problem, because they don't have deep API inspection. They're not going to see the activities in, in the apps. But it's a great starting place to tell the problem. Now, if you already know the problem, any, as I mentioned before, all the CASBs pretty much offer, offer this for free. You can just call them up and say, hey, come and do this risky stuff, I need to know the problem. If you already know the problem, you can skip over this part, because this is more of a commodity, right? This is, this is not a strategy. Is there a way to tighten this thing? Kind of holding up there. <laughs> All right, that's not, a, that's not a strategy. So your strategy isn't block. Let me tell me the problem, and then I'll just use that information to block. Right? We'll talk about that. So you need that information potentially to move to stage two, which is the holy grail, in my opinion, of what a CASB should be doing, and that is preventing the exfiltration of data. And that's really at the heart of, of what this stuff is, right? We are preventing the data from getting where it doesn't belong. That's what a CASB should be doing for you. Now, there's a lot of ways we can do this. We talked about, you know, it says in here, sanctioned to unsanctioned app. So, you know, what prevents your user, even though you have a sanctioned app? Let's say that you're sanctioning Office 365 and you're using SharePoint. One of your users pulls a file out of there and then says, you know what, I'm going to work on this at home and moves it over to their, box, their personal box account or their personal OneDrive account. You know, what stops them from doing that? So yeah, we can control data at rest inside of a sanctioned app. That's important. We can encrypt files in there. We can scan it you know, for malware. You want to do all of those things. Uh, but unless you're taking care of the data in motion, you're, you're missing 95% of, of your cloud usage. Right? So that's dangerous. All right, so we talked about this pretty much at length. You know, it should be an enablement technology. We won't allow the apps to be used. There's no getting away from it anymore. We, we have, uh, I dealt with a customer who said, I just need you guys because 
I can't listen to my HR department anymore. They're driving me freaking crazy, right? They all they do is complain because I'm we're blocking everything. Because so I just need to enable it and, and secure it. Um, again, that that has to be your strategy, coupled with you know that SSL inspection, that deep API inspection. All of those things are what you don't have today, for the most part, right? That this is going to give you, and it's rapidly evolving. All right, so I touched on this too. Um, this, which is allow you know being able to detect managed versus unmanaged devices. So we we do that internally. And if I plop my laptop on one of your networks, I better not be able to get on. Um, I have in a couple instances in some networks, but uh, I shouldn't be. So you want to make sure that the same applies to the cloud. There has to be some audit on the endpoint, whether that's a certificate check or even a deep, you know, op SWAT audit of the endpoint to see, hey, are you running this kind of encryption? Are you attached to this domain? Are you running these processes? Um, do you have these files installed? And if you do, you're a managed device, right? And if you're a managed device, then you get all the access that you should get to your cloud apps, especially sanctioned ones. But if you're not a managed device, then you should be extremely limited. So if I go home and try to go into our corporate box account and I get on my wife's computer, um, it should know that that is not my corporate device and it should limit me to either viewing only or maybe nothing, right? So that's a very important piece of the world because if the user is the new perimeter, um, we need to know a little bit about that user before they get to our data and their device. So we can, uh, we can talk about different ways that you can do that, but it, it's certainly built in. All right, um, step five is, is all about threat detection. So uh, this has also been rapidly evolving probably over the last six months, I'd say, in, in CASU. And that is the ability to obviously detect malware in sanctioned apps, which is think of it as data at rest. So being able to scan any file that's been dropped in a sanctioned app, but also in motion. So data going to any cloud app. And, and the goal here is to stop the cloud propagation of malware. Because if I put a piece of malware up in, in our corporate box account or OneDrive, and then I'm sharing it with a bunch of people, well, they just got that. Or if I'm syncing files, now I just pull the file down automatically to my, to my endpoint, right? So it has to be robust. And it can't just be, hey, by the way, we OEM, you know, one of the big name antivirus. I mean, it has to be that, it has to be dynamic, sandboxing, the same stuff you're doing internally has to be done for, for your cloud data. And then you throw on top of that anomaly detection. So who's bulk uploading and downloading files? Are they logging in from two different locations in a given period of time, right? Are they sharing credentials into an app? User behavior analytics is a big term in the industry, right? Now it's built into cloud usage. I'm pretty predictable, so I wake up in the morning, I go to the same things I usually go to, and I move similar files. So it's pretty steady. But it would be very easy to see deviations in my behavior if I log in from China at 3 in the morning and go to apps I've never gone to before. Kind of an extreme example, but that's the kind of stuff that needs to be looked at, right? Again, we're extending the stuff that we're doing internally that's worked very well now into cloud because we don't protect the app, we protect the data. Oh, and there's one other thing with uh, ransomware. So one of the new things that's coming out is, um, and I don't know if this is unique to cloud, but uh, being able to detect how files are being encrypted. And I don't have all the expert details on this yet, but when something, if somebody gets it and it's trying to encrypt data in your sanctioned application, and, and possibly if it's not using your keys to encrypt it or some other checks it's doing, it's going to be able to stop it, right? And the files that it does encrypt, the first couple, will obviously be restored from previous versions. So that's all in the works of, of taking care of ransomware in the cloud. It's pretty cool stuff. And then the last one is uh, coaching users, right? And, and this probably, at first glance, doesn't seem like it's an important part, but this is actually one of my favorites. Uh, if we're behind a proxy 
and we go to a website that we're not allowed to go to, what happens? It throws us this big abrasive alert that says, you know, screw you. <laughs> You're not going there, right? And um, that's that's not how a CASB does it. So a CASB is going to, you're going to try to move sensitive data to a place you shouldn't. Uh, it could be PCI data, PHI data, I mean, whatever compliance you have, we can look for it. When you do that, it's going to pop up something up and say, you know, this is this is not the place you should be putting this data, um, so we're not going to allow you to do it. And by the way, here is the place where you should be putting it in our sanctioned application or internally to our network. This doesn't go outside, therefore, you know, so you do that enough times that users will learn, you know, and they're automatically going to go to the desired behavior. If you send out an email saying, hey, by the way, we prefer everybody to put everything in box, please, and uh, here's the link, I mean, who's going to remember that? Who's going to care? <laughs> you know, nobody's going to care about that. So you're real time educating the users to what you want them to do, real time. So you pop that up and you can brand it any way you want and you can have it say, you can even have it redirect automatically to the desired behavior. Right? So that's an important piece uh, of that whole process. And in order to do that, obviously, we kind of go back and look at that deep API inspection, all of those activities that you can create policy on to stop that and pop that message up, all the stuff that we were talking about. Uh, so I think this is probably the last slide, and this talks about, you know, the first generation CASBs versus the second. Um, and I think it's important to differentiate between the two. When, when CASBs first came out a few years ago, uh, their goal was to tell you the problem, right? And I, I think there's a commercial out there. Did anybody see this commercial where a guy comes in, he's a termite, he's, he's a spotter, mm -hmm. and, he, and he's, they have termites all over the place, and they say, um, what are you going to do about it? He goes, well, I, I'm just the, the monitor. <laughs> I don't do anything about it, right? And that's kind of what CASB was, in the, you know, when it came out. Um, tell me the problem, and then just that blocking strategy, which, of course, we know doesn't sustain. It's not going to work. Uh, it doesn't do, you know, doesn't look at any activity. Um, it's not doing, you know, or it is doing basic DLP, so it regex and keyword matches and things, and it, basically wasn't doing any threat detection. So very, very basic problem. Then we moved into, you know, now the second generation of CASBs, and that is that 100% coverage for all the apps. Um, you know, blocking those activities, not the app itself. And then uh, true enterprise class DLP, and that's important, right? That's probably one of the things when you're going down this path you want to ask about. How enterprise class is your DLP engine? Because really, at the end of the day, or seeing activities, but your ability to detect that behavior comes from your DLP and policy engine. So that is one of the most important pieces of any one of these products is how enterprise is going to do proximity analysis and or logic, um, fingerprinting, exact match, all of the stuff that, you know, that we need internally and we need for the cloud as well. So you want to ask that question. You really want to test out those DLP engines because if you can't, if you can see it but not enforce it, if you can't see it, um, obviously it's no good. Right? And so you're only as good as your policy and you're behind the scenes. And then obviously all that threat intelligence that I talked about, uh, all of that now is, is built into these products. So you can see, I mean, it's very robust. It's come a long way in a very short amount of time. Uh, so there's a lot to look at. But those are the things that you want to focus on when you go through this process. All the stuff I talk about, those activities, right, um, those are important to DLP engine. That should be your strategy going forward because you want to future-proof yourself to whatever you end up with. And a lot of these out there, you're, they're not future-proof. They'll cover you for now for six months, right? And then a year from now, you're going to be like, well, I really want to stop this from going into unsanctioned apps. And they're, oh, sorry, we can't do that, right? Now you've got a whole other project on your hand. So, uh, this is a summary I'm not going to go through. And that's it. Any questions? No questions. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time.